We had to read a lot of haiku, and we read some basho and segyo, and we were learning, and we did read almost as much haiku as we could find, mostly Japanese, of course, and old. But we're going to, this is a discussion of Zen and haiku by Suzuki, the famous writer about Zen. Before basho, the haiku man indulged in wordplay which incited them to raise the dignity of haiku to a higher level. In many ways, haiku may be said to reflect the Japanese culture. First of all, the Japanese are not given to verbosity. They are not argumentative. They shun intellectual abstractions. They are more intuitional and wish to give out facts as facts without much comment, emotional, as well as conceptual. What is known as Kami Nagara no Michi is the credo, quote, to leave things to be, to leave things to the will of the gods and not to interfere with them with human scheming, Co coincides well with the Buddhist teaching of suchness. Tathata, 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 which is in colloquial Japanese, sono mama. <laughs> Suchness, son, sonomama. Mm -hmm. You like sonomama? That's suchness. Mm -hmm. Is that like the. I think if you don't have to feed your to rabbits God, anymore, huh? your dog can feed the rabbits. I thought you were responding to my reading. Huh? Okay. You responded to suchness of a rabbit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She responded to a rabbit. A dog What's feeding the rabbits. A dog feeding a rabbit is your suchness. And a duck is coming. Ducks are coming. You see, you don't have to feed your animals in the house. The dog will take care of everything now. Oh, and then animals are naturally into And a pig is coming mm. also to eat carrots. Mm. Mm -hmm. Everyone looks at their phone while during the reading. How so. carefully the dog is looking at everyone eating. It's amazing. Well, no. you're looking at the phone is serendipitously coincidental to my reading, so it's and it's very it fitting. It seems the ducks are keeping away, not so comfortable by coming close to the pig or to the rabbit. I'll assume that they they fit right into my reading, based on some kamama <laughs> suchness. The pig is pulling a carrot so for, forcefully. But you can where get it this, away from where the Where is this pig the going? Let me the, see it. Of the yeah. dog. You cannot take it out of the dog's mm -hmm. mouth. Mm -hmm. Can you see it? <laughs> you see it? He pulls it, he pulls it, but can't get it off. He gets Who is feeding who here? The dog is feeding all the animals in the yeah, house. They're into animal. Animals have a better consciousness. Uh, that's the latest word. Sonomama is the ultimate reality itself. We humans, however fiercely or desperately we may strive or struggle, can never go beyond this. without asking why or how. This is
quote a solitary traveler who is Basho feels something of himself in the approaching winter. This is life of eternal longing. I had first winter rain. <laughs> it's raining right now. <laughs> or snowing. The most inappropriate, uh, number three, a most inappropriate object, quote, such as a name or sin, significant plant in bloom. These are topics of haiku. Kusa, Mira, Ya, Na, Mo, Siranu, Siroku, Saku. Among the grasses, an unknown flower blooming white. Hmm. This is by Siki. Remember Siki is a woman poet? Yeah. I don't know, is it Siki a woman? We're try testing our memory. Siki. 1869 to 1902, one of the most modern haiku poets. While Siki is not a blind follower of Basho and awful, often depreciates Basho as too much of a subjectivist. I don't know if it's a woman or not. This haiku on a white flowering plant is something similar to Basho's on a Nazina herb. So Siki makes no reference to a careful observation as Basho does, which may be said to be Basho's subjectivism. C. Key's verse particularly echoes Basho's sentimentalism. If this term is applicable to the seasonality, spirituality of the flower in the crannied wall, or of the Bible, biblical lilies of the field, no mo shiranu means the snail, unknown, insignificant, humble, being ready to feed the oven tomorrow. Would you like some more coffee? Yeah, this is really an ep epitaph we have to give to everything great and small. Huh. Hmm. Oh, no, 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 please, please don't do it. Yeah. If you already have a series of those, you would be tired. He's famous, though. I need a scholar. You're tired. I don't have a scholar present. Don't you make a... Uh, I need uh, Suzuki. Scholars, uh, but he could be Suzuki. <laughs> I can be nothing more than a dream. It was really an epitaph to have give, to give anything, we created small existing in its own right, for it is a nothing of no value whatsoever until it stands connected with the totality of being embraced in the divine grace, as Chris and John would say. Basho observed his Nazina by the wild hedge in this light. I would like to see Siki too, observing the white blooming plant among the grasses in the same light. Number four, the octopus in a jar. Kako, Shibo, Ni. Ha, Kanaki, Yumi, Nyoho, Natsu, No, Siki. The octopuses in the jars, transient dreams, the summer moon. I understand the fisherman sinks a jar into the sea. And the octopus, thinking it is a fine shelter, gets into it. While it is sleeping there and perhaps enjoying an innocent dream, the crafty fisherman pulls up the jar together with this occupant or occupants, as the case may be. This is what we call human intelligence, by which we not only keep ourselves alive, 
but to a greater or lesser extent destroy one another as intelligence grows up to systematize knowledge. As to the poor octopuses entrapped, we think they go on dreaming uh, a transient dream under the summer moon. But who would not say that men are of superior intelligence when they go on devising all sorts of wonderful weapons of mutual annihilation? Who would not call this dreaming a transient dream under the summer moon, or in fact anywhere? Haiku Naki means not only transient, but vain, inane, futile, useless. It is not only the octopus snugly dreaming in the fisherman's jar, but every one of us, including the fisherman himself, keeps on dreaming idle things, thought dreams, if not for the moon of suchness. Of any season, summer or winter, our existence here on earth could not be anything but vanity of vanity, says Ecclesiastes Christ. What profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? The haiku says the octopus is in the jars, transient dreams, the summer moon. Haiku 5. The firefly flying flickeringly. O bo ta hu u ra hi li tu tori keri. A huge firefly, wavering li, passes by. Yu yari yu yari is to the original Japanese for wavering li, which is Dr. Blight's translation. I do not know whether or not this is a happy English word for yu yari yu yari to, to. The word is one of those Three triplicates, which appeal more to the feeling than to the intellect, and therefore are not convertible into abstract conceptual terms. Both the Chinese and the Japanese languages abound with these three duplicatives, showing that the people who use these languages are not so used to the abstract way of thinking as are most of the Western peoples. Also that the Easterners live closer to the pristine advent experiences of reality than those peoples who have highly developed their systems of analysis and abstraction. Probably there is no one English word equivalent to yurari yurari to waveringly, unsteadily, unreliably, discontinuously, fluxing, fluxingly, vibratingly, unquietly, are all conceptual. Whereas you, ra, re, you, ra, re, to, no doubt, describing a con discontinuous movement is very much more than that. It suggests feelings of freedom, unconcernedness, dignity, not being hurried by anything external, leisurely taking one's own time. Do you ever take your own time leisurely mm -hmm. when you pass by? You supposedly pass Most by. Of the time. You say, let's pass by the place. Mm -hmm. Do you just pass by? Mm -hmm. Do you do it in a urari, urari kind of way? I have no idea what that means. Wavering way. Mm -hmm. Do you waver during your passing by? Yeah. I do that right now. Are you a huge firefly? No. Hmm. Leisurely taking you one's own time when I'm these feelings. Human fly. Huh? Do you fly? I'm a human firefly. You're a human firefly. When these feelings are combined with the verb of action, Tori Kerry, the firefly, not a small one, but a huge one, reminds us of a person living a life of freedom fearlessness and individual dignity with the air of aloofness and transcendentalism. Dear, are you a person living a life of freedom, fearlessness, and individual dignity with an air of aloofness and transcendentalism? Are you? I'm a little mixed up. <laughs> a firefly passing on through the air is not attached to the ground in its sordidness. Isha. Remember Isha? Yeah. 
Do you like Isha? I guess they do. I-S-S-A? Yeah, I remember. She was the funny one. 1763 to 1827. He's the funny one. Mm -hmm. Funny Isha. He wrote with honey for animals, didn't he? I think that's correct. Isha, the author of this haiku. That's his, uh, his, uh, his haiku. The Firefly is said to have spent some months revisit, revising it before he could settle on the final form. Though it looks as spontaneous as if it were a work of instant inspiration. Let us let me add to this connection. A word about the literal use of reduplicatives and other proverbial expressions of a similar nature, which give a great advantage to the Chinese and the Japanese languages in communicating a certain type of experience. When they are translated into conceptual and intellectual well-defined terms, these expressions lose their rich personal flavor and imaginative depth of that beguiling vagueness. This is will readily be understood when we compare to the Chinese originals. For instance, of Lao Tzu or Suan Tzu, descriptions of the Tao Man, the Tao Man, with the English versions of the same. How prosaic and uninteresting and impersonal the latter reads. The Oriental peoples are sometimes said to be deficient in the power of philosophical thinking and analytical preciseness. Perhaps they are, but they have richer store of the experiences of reality itself, which refuses to be so sharply defined that yes can never be no and no yes. Nowadays, I am told, the physicists are trying to use the concept of complementarity, complementarity, seeing that one theory is in exclusion of an antagonistic one does not explain everything. Life goes on whether or not we logically comprehend and mechanically control it, though this does not mean that we are to give up all such attempts. It is best to recognize that there is something in life whose mystery goes beyond our intellectual prehension. The you yari you yari why you are a ri why you are a ri way of a huge firefly passing before my window contains in it all the that defies our relativistic scrutiny. The poem goes, O oh, Botaru, Yu Ya Ri Yu Rari To Tori Geri. A huge firefly waveringly passes by. Do you like the poem? Read it again. Read it again. Mm -hmm. God. I'm not going to waver to that. <laughs> That's wavering. I'm not going to waver. I'm going on to number six. Fallen leaves under the water. Mitsu. Oh, it's a small haiku. Read it. Read it again. Mm -hmm. That's wavering in my reading. A huge firefly waveringly passes by. Mm -hmm. By Isha, your favorite. Is she your favorite? No. No, Basho. Basho. Sanyo. Sanyo. I thought Sagio was good. Sagio, Basho. But I thought Basho like admired Sagio. So Sagio is the first one. Sagio I like the most. The one who wrote that beautiful poem about the pine tree. You remember? Mm. Fallen leaves under the water. Misu Soko no. Iwa ni achi suku. Kono ha kana. Remember, I almost had learned Japanese. I know, like one word. You see, I'm, I'm going to read you that poem, Cranes. Kana. Over the so. highest mountains, the Himalayas. Uh -huh. Over the highest concentration of mountain peaks. Hmm. Over the highest peaks, the Everest. A flock of cranes reaches the very top and crosses. You wonder what to admire best, the cranes or the Everest. They linger not flying high over the top, flying higher than Everest.
That's like haiku, huh? No? You can reduce it to a haiku if you have the. What's a ho to to ge gisu? Isn't that the cuckoo bird? <laughs> How many Japanese words do we know? <laughs> this is by Joe So. 1661 to 1704, one of the chief disciples of Basho, specifically and ordinarily. It says, under the water, on the rock, resting the fallen leaves. Officially, or nay, most of us are reliable to think nothing of fallen leaves of autumn finding their final resting place on the rocks in the stream. They are now all discolored, showing none of the yellowish and, ye yellowish and yet reddish tinge they had while on the trees. But after being hurled up and down here and there in the corners of the garden and upon the roofs of the house, they are finally settled under the water and safely over the rocks. Perhaps some further fate may be waiting for them, but as far as the poet sees, they are quietly resting, as if this were their final place. Do you think leaves have a final place? Mm -hmm. Sometimes they'll get caught in a corner somewhere. Oh, the final place is just zero. No, leaves will blow. They'll deteriorate. So and then some, left nothing of them. some of them catch in some elements will be left. They right? catch in some corner under a rock and they stay there. Mm, they'll deteriorate if they're there, even there. Are you, in some sense, caught under a rock, like a no, fallen leaf? No, I am. I am, in a sense, a fallen leaf. Look at those characters everywhere. Mm, I'm stuck. I'm stuck in my rocked place. Fallen leaf. Hmm. Don't worry, he'll deteriorate. Am I ever going to get out of that stuckness? Mm -hmm. hmm. Quietly resting as if this were their final place, he does not venture to think of anything beyond. He just sees them there and gives no intimation as to what he has in his mind. This is it is this very silence of the poet that makes the verse all the more eloquent. We also, we also stop here with the poet, yet we feel that there is something much more than we can expressively utter. This is where the haiku is at its best. Dr. Blight sees here the suchness of things. I would like to see the mystery of being. This one is Mitsu Soko no Iwa ni Achi Tsuku Kono Akana Under the Water on the rock resting the fallen leaves. See, I'm stuck in a corner crevice. <laughs> my stuckness. <laughs> How am I going to get out of my rut? <laughs> mm -hmm. well, I'm just going to rot there. <laughs> hmm. Lice and fleas, and this is poem number seven, the lice and fleas on the stable. No me, shira me, uma no, mio suru, makira moto. Please rise, lice, the horse pissing near my pillow. <laughs> That's horrible. This is a basha one. We remember all these. But now we are doing analysis. <laughs> hmm. We're doing analysis? Mm -hmm. We're here with uh, Sat on, Suzuki here. David. <laughs> He's reading it. David. We have a top scholar. Put it away. It's him. His Come name on. is. I'm a top scholar. David. We're doing analysis. You're not doing anything. <laughs> a strange. We're reading. A strange combination of things. If they are suggestive of anything, it is something disgusting, utterly annoying, repugnant. What else could Basha feel in those circumstances? Is there anything at all evocative of poetic feelings? This will be what we would like to know. The haiku has a prelude. Basha happened to stop at a miserable shed in the mountains while traveling along the narrow road of Oko. The rain continuously for three days. The poor lonely traveler had nothing else to do but to stay patiently at the stable. He was, however, a poet. 
Let me quote what Dr. Blythe has to comment about the situation in the poet. It is really illuminating, showing how much of the haiku stutter the commentator has imbibed. Basho's verse is to be read with the utmost composure of mind. If there is any feeling of disgust and repugnance as a predominating element of the mind, Basho's intention is misunderstood. Please are irritating, lice are nasty things. A horse pissing close to where one is lying gives one all kinds of disagreeable feelings. But in and through all this, there is to be a feeling of the whole in which urine and champagne, or lice and butterflies, take their appointed and necessary place. We have to stop after a while because we have to get ready to go. <clears throat> This, as is, of course, is not Basho's meaning. This was certainly his experience, but we are concerned with his poetical experience, which is a different thing, and yet somehow the same thing, sometimes not by any means always a simple and elemental experiences of things, whether of lice or of butterflies, the pissing of horses, or the flight of eagles have a great significance, not of something beyond ourselves, but of their own essential nature. We must lodge with these things for a night, for a day, for three days. We must be cold and hungry, flea-ridden, and lonely, companions of sorrow, and acquainted with grief. <clears throat> Are we acquainted with grief? Remember how Jesus was acquainted with grief in the Messiah? He was acquainted with grief. Basho's verse is not an expression of complaint or disgust, though he certainly felt irritation and discomfort. It is not an expression of philosophical indifference, nor an impossible love of lice and dirt and sleeplessness. What is it? What is it an expression of? It is the feeling, these things too. But anyone who tries to finish this sentence does not understand what Basho meant. There are a few of the subjects that have occupied the haiku poets of Japan, the moon and the sun, the storms and the waves and the mountains and the rivers, so-called bigger aspects of nature were also engaged their attention. But what I wish to emphasize here is this Japanese sensitivity for the small things of nature generally neglected by people of the West and the fact that these insignificant and ignoble creatures are in intimate relationship with the grand totality of the cosmic scheme. Japanese mysticism will not leave them out as too mean for human, and for that matter, divine consideration. This is more than delicate feminine sentimentalism. It is where Zen comes in, becomes associated with haiku. We found how Zen is associated with haiku. Hmm. Hmm. The mean little critters. <laughs> hmm. This poem is dedicated to the great sleep out. We're going to post this one. This great sleep. Great sleep out. Of 2019. Remember all those people sleeping in Times Square? Mm -hmm. Please. Yeah. Please, why is the horse pissing near my pillow? No, me, shira, me, uma, no, no, suri, ma, pura, moto. We read poem seven. For whatever reason, we started with poem two or something. The poem started it. Actually, we read section four. We read seven haiku poems with analysis and we were looking for how Zen fits in and we had a, a top scholar here to help us Suzuki yeah we had the author so we were reading we read with him present hmm. 